Hi, everyone. Welcome to Potluck Food Talks. Today, we're going to talk about booze, mixology. <laughs> mixology, the arts of uh, of getting you buzzed and happy. Yeah, the art of getting drunk uh, with with class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of mixology. I mean, mixology is such a weird term, you know, but uh, it's something that's I found it really fascinating. I remember when the first time I went into like a really high class bar and you get drinks that are so, you know, curated. And I found it so interesting that you had this glass of like liquid, you know, and it was mixed in such a way that the, the elements, which are not a lot of elements, you know, they work together so perfectly and create something really, really complex. And I found that really, really interesting from a, from a culinary point of view. Yeah, I completely agree. It's kind of like a liquid cooking or something like that, but you're not cooking. You're just mixing, but you're cooking in the sense that, that you're mixing things and tasting until you get the, the perfect spot and, you know, and, and then know how to find a way to replicate it many times. That's kind of like cocktail making process, I would say. Yeah, totally. I remember I thought like back when that happened to me, I was in my apprenticeship. And I was really fascinated with uh, sauce making. And, um, you know, when you make a sauce and it's kind of like you already have it at a point where it's very tasty, but just like getting, trying to creep up to that point where everything is just perfect, you know? And then especially when you have somebody who really knows what they're doing and you make something and taste it, they're like, yeah, it's good. But like, dude, add a little bit of this, add a little bit of that. And they get it to that perfect sweet spot and you taste it and you're like, oh my God, now it's amazing, you know? Yeah, I had a, a soup uh, in my apprenticeship. It, it was kind of like a Caribbean bouillabaisse and this like French, uh, classic French uh, Caribbean restaurant where, where I learned. And yeah, it was this bouillabaisse, but it would also like the classic ingredients of the bouillabaisse, but then also some Latin twist. It, it had even some hot sauce and you had to find a way to get the the right flavor, you know, like if you already knew the soup, you would know how to get there and adding a little bit more of this. Oh, no, it's not there. Okay. Now, now there it is, you know, like, because it's not like a cocktail that you just do that once and then you know how to replicate it many times. Yeah, totally. You know, like I, it was the same in Thai cooking. Like when I, when I learned how to cook like Northern Thai food with the sometime dressing, it's just like fish sauce, tamarind, lime juice and chili, right? And palm sugar. So you have, you know, sweet, salty, sour, spicy, you know, all those like quintessential Thai flavors. And you would try to get them into like the perfect balance where they have to be, where everything plays together. And that would be very difficult, you know, and you, you'd like, especially me, you know, because it's so highly seasoned, like I taste it, I'd be like, okay, now it's good. And then, you know, the, the head chef would like taste it and be like, no, no, it needs more. This needs more. That needs to have more, 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 more. And you season it and season it and season it until it's at that very sweet spot where you couldn't possibly season it anymore you know yeah and also the thing about cocktails is that the um, aroma spectrum is you know you can have like super dry cocktails or you can have a dessert cocktail something that that is like a, a you know let's say a cheesecake made or a milk rice made cocktail or if we talk about classics like a piña colada i, I, I would say it goes in that direction while you have other things that are completely dry, uh, like a martini or something like that. Or like really fresh and acidic, you know, like a daiquiri or, um, uh, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. And like, I also think that the range of products is really interesting, you know, like, I mean, a lot of the bars that I went to that I found really interesting, like, for example, a bar that we both know well in Berlin, uh, Buck and Breck, which is a... My favorite bar in the world. It's amazing. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, especially back then it was, it was back then when we went, it was run by, uh, Holger Kroll and, um, this salsa it's got like a Portuguese name, the salsa. Okay, okay. Sorry if I'm, sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Man, I, I love that place because the whole experience of going to that place. Uh, so to tell the story that imagine you're walking in Berlin and there is just like a door in the middle of nowhere. Uh, with a ring and you have to know that the, the, there is a bar. So you you ring the bell and and if you're like the right amount of people or whatever, you get in and it's just a bar with, what, 10 seats, something like that. Had it like two tables in the back. I'm not sure. May, maybe so. But let's say maximum like 15 people if it was fully packed to the very end, maximum. 
And and what I liked about that place is that there were no labels of anything. Like they had these color codes on the bottles and they knew exactly what to take and, and how to mix the cocktails. Everything was super neutral and minimalist, like, like in terms of, of ambience. And then the cocktails were Super elegant, man. All of those cocktails were like, like super thoughtful or well executed. Even the classic ones. I remember ha- having a dark and stormy there many times. That was like super properly executed. Yeah, man. They were on another level. I mean, like I learned most of the things that I now know about like mixology in that place. They had a lot of classic cocktails that you don't see any anywhere anymore. You know. Things like a uh, clove club. They had a Ramos gin fizz, which is one of my favorite drinks, you know, which nobody does because it's notoriously hard to make. I mean, it's, it's very simple, but it's, it's got a funny backstory actually. So a gin fizz, you know, everybody knows. And a Ramos gin fizz is, um, special because it's got a little bit of orange blossom water and a little bit of cream, like just like single cream. And because of that, it needs to get shaken very hard and for like a very long time so that it like emulsifies and that it doesn't separate in the glass. So um, it comes from this country club where they invented a drink and they had a barman mixing the drinks and then behind them two guys that he would just hand a shaker to that would just shake and shake and shake and shake and shake and shake and shake because you had to shake it for like a minute solid nonstop. And if you do the, if you do like 10 in a row, you know, you're exhausted. So he, every barman just had like guys behind him to shake these drinks. And yeah, they would do things like that. But also on top of that, they would have really special spirits. You know, they, I remember they had like a mustard seed distillate that they sourced in Germany. You know, they had, they had like very, they had like a cumin kind of liqueur and like very sort of unusual things that they sourced, you know, that they then used for, for their cocktails. But also, like you said, you know, the, the big thing was just that they executed things perfectly. Everything was just spot on, in balance, perfectly executed. The service was amazing, like such a small space and only like two people working at the same time behind the bar. If, if at all, sometimes just one person. Yeah. yeah. And, but, but they treated you super well. The ambience was amazing. It was sort of like mellow hip hop playing. And it really, for me, like I found it, it, it really set the bar for a lot of things. Did you ever try this? Super crazy piña colada masters in Japan. You know what I'm talking about? No. No. Well, the, 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 I'm not the, sure. Like this guys that make piña colada in, in Japan with a, like a, a specific super like robotic shaking technique. And it, it's like this big thing. It's like, I think the, the, the most expensive piña colada in the world by the, greatest piña colada master and it's like yeah i think i saw this in a mind of a chef episode like david chang was tra- traveling in tokyo and visiting this place yeah i i've definitely seen it but i mean like you know piña colada is a great example of like a drink that like usually when you order it it's just really horrible you get like canned fucking coconuts cream can't everything. Can't, yeah. Can't pineapples and can't everything. Everything. And it's like super sweet and like, you know, rum and blah, and it's horrible. <laughs> it's like creamy and that. But if you get, you know, fresh coconut water, fresh coconut cream, you know, and like fresh juiced pineapple, that stuff's delicious, you know? And then you have a high quality rum and you mix that together. It's, it's an amazing drink. Yeah. I've had nice piña coladas mainly in Venezuela and it was, it was quite something having a super good one. Uh, I, have, I have good memories of that. Yeah. But I'm not surprised that Japan is on such a forefront of mixology because this like aspect of kind of like getting things to perfection and also the gesture of things, you know, the mixing. Because the mixing is very important. You know, you have to think that why do you mix a cocktail with ice? It's just sort of like it's to cool it down, obviously, but also to dilute it, you know? Like um, if you would just mix, like for example, take a Negroni, right? You can, of course, just mix equal parts of Campari, red vermouth, and gin and just mix that together and put it in a glass. But it's not going to be the same. It's going to be very brutal. And like stirring it um, in, in, a, in a glass, you know, with the ice, it cools it down, but it also dil- like dilutes the alcohol with the water from the melting ice and getting it to the perfect point where it's right at that sweet spot where it's alcoholic enough, but like not too watery, not too strong. 
that's that's really heavy and that's why like i think like this japanese mentality the sort of shokunin mentality that fits perfectly i've been to some amazing bars in japan i mean one really good example is a place called jen yamamoto which also is um it's just one guy behind a counter with this sort of kaiseki attitude to cocktails it's seasonal cocktails you basically you have like a omakase cocktail tasting nice and he yeah, and it like it uh, focuses on regional produce and seasonal produce, you know, so fruits and vegetables and uh, herbs and other ingredients that kind of like are in season at that moment. And then, you know, he presents it, you know, most of the time with something natural, kind of like um, akin to ikebana. Ikebana is the, the art of flower arranging in Japan. So you have to drink. And something that's a reference to what's in the drink next to it. And it's a super beautiful experience. Oh, nice. nice. I, I know Ikebana and, and I've seen this kind of Ikebana interactions in food, but not, not with drinks. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like a, a cool bar where I, I was running a lab in, in a restaurant in Bolivia. And this restaurant, part of the concept was not to use only Bolivian ingredients. And... You know, this this was cool, especially at the bar, because they, they wouldn't use any kind of foreign liquors nor soft drinks. And so non Coca-Cola was not allowed or this kind of drinks, you know. So everything was like, uh, it was very organic driven, like making uh, bitters or all kind of kombuchas or fresh juices or all this kind of stuff, uh, infusions and so on. And there was like this, this guy, his name is Josue Grajeda. Uh, he was uh, like, like a, a young guy that learned in that in that part, and this guy was like really super intuitive in the in the way of making cocktails. And I remember he went to like this uh, national championship there, and I don't know if he won or got second place. I think he won actually, and this was like super cool, you know, to to win a, a national contest without using any foreign liquors and working only with with um, bitters and macerations and this kind of stuff like, like that you did homemade. I think that's super cool uh, having a bar with that approach. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think that a lot of really interesting techniques came from, you know, bar culture. Like, have you heard of like milk filtering sort of like infusions? No, I have no idea about that. Okay, so I, I don't know super well how to do it, but basically like you take a liquid and you mix it with milk and the fat from the milk sort of like absorbs like the the sort of like particles in the liquid and then you filter it out like the the milk kind of like curdles in a way and then you filter it out and you get a really really clear liquid so for example you can do it uh, with exactly an example with uh, lemon for example and then you get like a super clear like water liquid that tastes like lemon you know and you're like, wow, this is, uh, this is really, really cool, you know? And then there's also, you have all the, you have a very, very sort of clean flavor. Yeah. I imagine it filters a lot of stuff, but the, the, there's a lemon essence that, that you can see cleaner, right? Yeah, exactly. And like all these sort of like filtering and like sort of macerating techniques, you know, it's, uh, it's crazy. Like what, what's been happening in the, in the bar world, like these last couple of decades, it's insane. Yeah. Also, um, the Nordic influence, I think it's, uh, uh, places like empirical creating like a whole new direction and, and liqueurs and also i mean this story i just told about bolivia this is completely a nordic cuisine influence you know like, like having this approach of doing everything at home and not getting foreign produce and so on do you have any favorite mixologists or bartenders or someone you you would like to mention um, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Charles Schumann, you know, the classic Charles Schumann. I mean, he's a, if, if nobody knows, if you don't know Charles Schumann because of his work in, you know, gastronomy, then maybe you know him as a model for Davidov and, uh, and whatnot. He's a very, he's a style icon, you know, but he's a, he's a guy, he's based in Bavaria in Munich and he is bar called Schumann's bar. It's been around forever and he wrote um, this sort of like cocktail companion called also Schumann's where he basically lists all the classic cocktails and how to make them. 
and he's just like he's basically like the Eckhart Witzigmann or the the Paul Bocuse of uh, of mixology. Yeah, like worldwide. <laughs> he's, a, no, he's not only in Germany. Worldwide. Yeah. Worldwide, yeah. But um, he's also just like I. I also like him just because he's such a character. I met him when I was in Japan. Like I remember, I was at this really really nice bar uh, called Bar Trench. This run by uh, Rogerio Igarashi. And it's also this like small neighborhood bar in Ebisu. Um, super, super nice. And it was uh, the Tokyo Bar Convention. And we were at this bar, you know, with lots of mix mixologists, you know, people from Hendrix Gin and that sort of stuff. And Charles Schumann pulls up in a taxi outside of the bar and he gets out of the taxi wearing a completely sort of like wine red suit, you know, with his like gray hair slicked back. And he walked into the bar and he's kind of like, you know, this sort of like this like advertisement, the most important man in the world. Yeah, like a, like know? a living God walking on earth and, and knowing it, you know, like. Yeah, you know, kind of like a little bit of a beard, gray hair, you know, like nice suit. And he's just sort of like the most charming guy you'll, you'll ever meet. Uh, um, but he's just like super authentic, you know, and like he stands for these for these like old school principles of hospitality and, you know, things, simple things done well. And I, I really dig that. I really like that. That's it for this week's episode of Potluck Food Talks. If you like what we're doing, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also find us on Instagram and TikTok as Potluck Food Talks. The show airs every Monday.